So, um, yeah, I'm Jane Six Smith. I'm the National Training Manager for, for Food for Life. Um, my specialism is in, in cooking. I was a, a, a secondary food teacher. Um, and then Michaela um, works alongside me and she's uh, also a cooking specialist and has taken sort of ownership of the Cook and Eat project uh, or the projects that we've, we've been working on. So Michaela is the absolute expert on, on Cook and Eat for, for Food for Life. So um, she's going to lead most of the presentation. Um, move our way through. So the, 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 the aim of this then really is to inspire and support you, um, you know, hopefully to set up and run some family focused cook and eat sessions. Uh, we, we, we're focusing on primary school settings. Um, this is not just about running um, cook and eat in community settings. And we're going to use the experience and examples that we've picked up along the way from the projects that we've, we have worked on and, and currently are working on. Um, We've come up ourselves against lots of barriers uh, and perhaps looked for the, the opportunities and, and the way that we can deliver that, you know, hopefully um, means it's a positive experience for everybody. So hopefully your confidence, knowledge and skills um, will be increased by the end of this session. Um, at the end, uh, at, at the end of the session, I, I, I'm hoping I'll be able to bring it up at the end of the presentation. But if I can't, you will get an email um, with some evaluation questions, which um, look or ask you questions about your, you know, whether you have perhaps got a bit more confidence now to to have a go at running Cook and Eat, um, and you know your knowledge has increased. Um, there's some other questions in there as well, so we'd really appreciate feedback on that because the feedback that we get allows us to measure our impact um, and then we can report to the people who commission the programmes, who, who pay for the programmes um, and then hopefully they continue to fund us. So as a, as a result of this webinar then hopefully you'll feel inspired to offer cook and eat sessions for families in your school. Um, you'll have some ideas for cook and eat activities that um, can support you towards your Food for Life uh, awards, um, especially around the community engagement element. Um, that you'll have some takeaway practical tips uh, and some resources for engaging with families on cook and eat projects. Um, Michaela will ask you, you know, which resources at the end might be helpful and we'll be able to get those to you. Um, and hopefully then at, at the end of it all, you will feel more confident to set up and deliver some simple cook and eat sessions. Um, I mentioned that um, cook and eat uh, can sort of, is part of our awards. Um, it doesn't say anywhere in the awards that you must run a cook and eat session. Um, but that would count towards um, that uh, community engagement element of it. So this one here in the bronze criteria, making efforts to actively engage parents and all the wider community in our growing and cooking activities. Um, so the idea being that, you know, the school is an education centre in its widest sense, um, provides people of any age and ability uh, with opportunities to participate in activities. So, you know, running a, a, a family cook and eat session takes that box straight away. Um, and as you go up through the awards, um, you know, that the, there are criteria around um, regularly getting parents in um, to support uh, around cooking and growing, um, and then even putting on specific education uh, around cooking and growing for, for parents and community members. Um, but yeah, so so a cook and eat lots of things, and, and Michaela will explore that in a lot more detail. So Michaela, I don't know if you're ready. If you can yeah. uh, take on uh, this now, and then I'll I'll monitor what's going on. Okay. So hi, yeah. So I'm Michaela, like Jane said. So I'm cooking eat, um, and currently best uh, based in Leicester and um, Walsall Commission at the moment. Um, but I wanted to talk to you today about cooking eat and how we engage. So lots of primary schools come to me and say they'd love to do cooking eat within school, but it's quite difficult to engage with certain families. Now, engagement tools that we um, have realised work really well. So using your newsletter, whether that comes electronically or paper version, 
um, putting something on there, inviting families, whoever's interested to come back uh, and put their name down. Um, social media platforms are great as well. If there's a Facebook page that the school has or an Instagram account or a Twitter account, there's always great to try and engage families to come along. Um, some schools do have their own social media platforms. For example, Dojo, um, some schools have. I know that some primary schools within reception um, and year one, they have something called Tapestry as well, which is a similar to Dojo that they can advertise on. Um, some some uh, primary schools actually like to target certain families, obviously without them knowing. And the targeted approach could be for many different reasons. It could be because there's some fussy eating in the family, which maybe you've noticed through lunch boxes or the dinner hall. Um, the lunch boxes I just mentioned can be problems within primary school um, and you think you might want to open um, some families up to other ingredients and other recipes that they can maybe cook for their families. There might be some weight management issues within families as well. Uh, they might be under the school nurse or under the paediatrician, um, nutritionist, dietitian. So you could help them in that aspect. Um, under nutrition as well, equally um, as bad. So malnourished. So maybe some children are coming in and you feel like they're not having breakfast. There's no hot meal at the end of the day. Um, and cook and eat is a great way for your families to cook together after school and then that hot meal gets taken home with them. So at least you know at least that one night that those children and those families are having a hot, hot cooked meal. And then um, linking with the food banks, which I will touch on a bit more a bit later on, because one of the main barriers I get from primary schools is we'd love to do it, but we don't have the money to do it. And what I mean by that is we don't have um, the money to buy ingredients and we don't have the money to buy equipment, um, which we'll touch on. So the link with the food banks works beautifully because it allows you to build a relationship with them, which is what you want, because lots of families will probably be engaging with them in your area. Um, and also they can support you in supplying ingredients. Uh, next slide, please, Jane. So here, so what will the families get help with? So this is, uh, what will the families get out of it really? How, what's the benefit of them coming along to a family cook and eat within school? Well, they'll be following recipes, uh, great for literacy skills, um, great for them to build their confidence in reading recipes, um, planning meals. So you could sit down with them and talk about how you could stretch certain meals out to batch cooking using leftovers, um, making sure that that meal is a healthy plate using the Eat Well Guide uh, to support that. Um, choosing and preparing ingredients. We like to give them a little bit of um, creativity when we cook as well. So if it has a certain ingredient in it, for example, a certain vegetable, I'll often have two or three of the different vegetables there that they can choose which one they like um, and give them ownership because we really want them to, to eat the food when it goes home or when they sit down and eat it. Nice skills are imperative and, and a must, and we teach them from four years old within Food for Life. Um, I'll talk a bit more about the knives as we go further on and what knives we do use, which is important. But knife skills are taught from four, um, and we use, like I said, certain knives um, to prevent anything from happening with fingers. Uh, and adults often need, um, you know, brushing up on their knife skills as well because um, yeah, some people like to cut in midair. I remember my nana used to do that, but things like that is obviously quite dangerous. Cooking methods and techniques, so different ways of cooking, maybe preventing or cutting down on frying, maybe introducing things like steaming is always good, obviously healthy option. Uh, cooking together as a family, now this is massive with Cook and Eat because so many good things come from cooking together as a family. Um, the children are more likely to eat the food that they cook, the social engagement, the talking, the communication, the verbal, the language development that can come from that. And also giving confidence to everybody in the kitchen that they can all um, have a hand in cooking. Trying new food, obviously that's quite a massive barrier within children and adults. Um, we all get stuck in the same, cooking the same meals over and over again. And trying new things can open lots of different doors to flavor combinations and um, increases confidence as well with eating and cooking. So we like to give them an opportunity to taste something new. And I'll just give you quick examples. For example, when it's asparagus season, we know it's expensive and we know that it's a very short season, but I often will take some asparagus into school and give the families an opportunity to, to taste it and see what it's like. 
Um, allergies and fussy eating are massive within, within families now. They're growing. It seems like more and more families are having to cook two, three, four different dishes um, for their families. And we want to stop that <laughs> because that's just energy, it's fuel cost, it's time. So we want to really reduce that. So we're thinking about how do we reduce the fussy eating? Well, you can reduce it by cooking together and introducing new foods. Um, and the allergy aspect, obviously, that's very important that you understand that the families are coming into your school beforehand, that you know of any allergies or any intolerances to food, because obviously you'd want to avoid that. But generally in school, nuts are avoided anyway, but things like dairy is high there um, on the allergies. Um, so yeah, just, just be careful of those. You can obviously use dairy alternatives as needed. Um, and then learning from others, you know, we've often got memories and lovely stories of cooking and eating together maybe growing up, um, we can talk about that. And then that peer support of having everybody in the same room, cooking the same dish, having the same experience can really help um, with confidence too. And next slide, please, Jane. So health and safety, we always get asked this question, Jane and I, what's important to have in place um, if you are cooking within school? Uh, and level two food safety training um, for key staff is great to have. Um, it's not law, um, but you have to show due diligence. And I would recommend that in a primary school, at least one person within that primary school has that certificate uh, and understands what's necessary. And then obviously that can be then taught to everybody else within school and what's necessary in terms of cross-contamination, preventing that from happening, preventing any form of food poisoning. Risk assessments are imperative as well. We know that in primary school, we have to risk assess everything. And believe me, I do know I'm a governor at my son's primary school, so I know how that um, is important in schools. But as far as food for life, we do have risk assessments already written, and that's something that we can provide you as a resource at the end of this webinar um, that covers you for everything. Um, but make sure you do risk assess. And it's not just actually the cooking, it's beforehand as well, making sure you've got access to hot water um, for hands washing and things like that. Uh, allergy policies, again, we just touched on that before, but making sure that you have a list. The school office often has a list of children with allergies within school, making sure that you're not, excuse me, cooking with anything that could harm anybody. The cooking environment. Now, you'll see some a few pictures along the line as we move forward. Now, you don't have to do this in a kitchen. It can be done in any room um, that's got space with tables, um, as long as you're near hot water and hot water's there for hand washing and to wash the equipment at the end of the session. But it doesn't have to be in a kitchen. You can do this in a classroom, in a hall. You could do this in the staff room, anywhere where you think's appropriate and that the families will feel comfortable. Um, Personal preparation is vital, so we teach the six-day hand washing technique, which you will teach your children anyway uh, in reception in year one, and we go through that as well. We wear aprons, uh, we roll our sleeves up, jewellery is removed, uh, especially rings. Um, we allow the wedding bands to stay on, uh, but any, any rings with beautiful diamonds, obviously uh, bacteria can get into those, so we ask to remove those. Hair tied back and nail varnish removed. Uh, I do want to just quickly mention um, the gel that you can have on your nails now because that is does become a problem when we have cook and eat and the gels generally are like glue they don't generally come off so you don't have to worry too much but if you're in a situation and you are concerned you can offer some gloves but please remember some people are allergic to latex so that's an important thing to remember. Um, cooking leaders uh, and health and safety role models so you have those in school anyway I'm sure you have a health and safety um, person that's connected. You probably have governors that are health and safety as well, just making sure that they know what's happening within school and they're happy with what you're doing. Um, and then extra precautions and considerations that we need to think of. And I'm, what I'm referring to there is obviously during COVID that we are now, um, things that maybe extra things that you need to think about. So during COVID, um, I have just gone back to deliver face-to-face -face myself. Um, so I can talk from personal experience on what this is like and how it is done. Um, social distancing during cooking lessons is very difficult unless you do what we call something a single set out, which I will touch on a bit later on. Um, so you'll often find that obviously you still have bubbles within the primary schools as well. So the children are fine, but then you obviously bring in adults into the situation. Then you need to obviously make sure that you are safe within them coming into the environment. So 
whatever procedure or policy you have in school for people coming into school would be the same for parents as well. So whether that's a lateral flow test, whether that's whatever the policy is, you need to make sure they're following that. Um, on the day, obviously we wash hands before we cook and we wash hands after we've handed something high risk like meat and fish. But I do say I wash my hands a lot more frequently during these sessions now. Uh, and we just make sure that everybody knows where the sink is and they're not crowded around it and they take their time. Um, sharing equipment, again, if they're in bubbles, fine. If not, you have single equipment. So single ingredients, single uh, equipment. So you only handle your own food and your own equipment. And then that gets taken away at the end by yourself. Obviously not the equipment, the food. Um, and then the, the equipment is washed up uh, by the deliverer in a safe environment. Obviously wearing rubber gloves is necessary. Um, tasting. Tasting is a big thing we do in Cook and Eat. We want everyone to taste um, and that's fine, but we just do it with spoons and we don't ever double dip um, and we just don't try to use our hands and obviously with smaller children that can be quite tricky. So what I like to do is I like to put a plate of food out for the children, for them themselves, that they can play and do with whatever they like and, and taste the food. Um, and recipes, uh, most recipes in my experience do work in cook and eat, but it's just about timings and it's just about how much preparation you do for them beforehand, which again, we'll come on to a bit further along the line. Um, so some other skills that we uh, talk about and think about when we're doing cook and eat is we follow recipes like we just discussed. Um, please remember and be very mindful of literacy um, capabilities when you're in that situation. There might be some people that can't read very well. So I often like to read or demonstrate myself so then before we do it, they can see it visually, what they're expected of them if they're, if they're struggling with reading. Seasonal fruit and veg preparation, everything we do in Food for Life is seasonal. Uh, we do that for many different reasons, for environmental reasons, climate. We do it for cost reasons. You'll find that the food is cheaper. Uh, at those times of the year as well. We cook with meat and fish, we're not scared to do that. Um, although there are health and safety implications through cross-contamination, which I mentioned before, but we do do that because I want, I want the families to be confident in dealing with uh, fresh meat and fish and, and what the procedures are to do that safely. Um, and then uh, we do a lot of recipes for vegetarians as well and vegans nowadays, um, lots of people are, um, and not just for religious reasons, for many other reasons. We make basic sauces, so like in the picture, basic tomato sauce and how that can be adapted to many different recipes. Um, pasta sauces, lasagnas, um, we make basic white sauces. Again, great skill to have making a roux from scratch and then obviously gradually adding the milk and that can be used in lots of pasta bakes. Um, we talk about different methods of cooking, so steaming, frying, baking, Microwave, we're not ashamed of moving the microwave. The microwave can be fantastic for families who are struggling financially because you don't have to have an oven on for an hour or a hob on for 20 minutes. It can reduce cost and you can produce fresh meals within the microwave. Um, I know that me and Jane love to steam our veggies in microwaves because it retains the flavour, it retains the nutrients um, and it doesn't overcook them. So don't be scared of that. Baking skills, again, you know, baking doesn't always have to be sweet. It can be savoury and we love to make savoury scones at Food for Life. We love our cheese and herb scones. We make one with butternut squash where we, we roast it and we mash it. Um, so thinking about baking maybe in a savoury aspect far less than we do sweet um, because obviously what we know is if children are cooking at home, they're often cooking with older relatives and they are often are, cook are baking. So that skill is already there. So we need to figure out other ways of, of incorporating skills into that too. Um, and that savoury baking, like I said, we incorporate as much fruit and vegetables as we can to increase our five a day. Um, seasonings, um, we're not afraid of using salt and pepper. Um, you are allowed to use it now within school meals, so we echo what you're allowed to do. We follow guidelines from the Eat Well plate and the advice on how much salt we have. Um, and we do use salt in our cooking, but it is, mod it is in moderation and we don't salt our food afterwards on the plate. And it's often used within cooking within water, which often what it does is it just sort of dissolves into the water and then you don't eat so much salt. Um, and herbs and spices are great to perk up any dish, but be aware us lucky people that have store cupboards at home, 
uh, or pantries if we're Nigella, we're not, but if we were, um, a lot of families don't have this option. They don't have store cupboards, they don't have herbs and spices. So what we do in Food for Life Cook and Eat is part of our uh, thing that we do is we actually give them little store cupboard bits every week. So for a recipe, if it needed soya sauce, for example, or a, a stock cube, we would supply that in their ingredients so we can start building a store cupboard up for them, which they absolutely love and they do use. And then we cook with staples um, because we know that's what families cook with, pasta, rice, noodles, potatoes, but we maybe just show them alternative ways of using them um, and different methods of using them, which can be a bit more healthier. And next slide, Jean. So this little um, picture here is, um, is, well, it's cooking skills to share. And what it is, it's a list of skills that children can learn throughout their time in primary school. And me and Jane really like to use it as like a tick box, really. So what we do is we print them off and we give it to the child and the families. And when they've achieved a particular skill, then they get to tick it off. And it's really rewarding and they love it. And when they've ticked all the skills and they can do everything, they come back to school with their little sheets and they're like, yes, we've done it. And it makes a massive difference. Uh, and this is a resource that will be available to you, like Jane mentioned at the, at, the, um, at the beginning, if you'd like this resource, because it really does work really well. And it shows at what age you, the appropriate skill could be taught and learnt, which is very tricky, tricky if you're not a cooking teacher to know um, so this is why this is so brilliant for you, because it will really help. And if you think, mm, could a four or five year old do this skill? Well, if you had this, you could have a look and then it will tell you straight away. It's a brilliant resource. Next one. So um, as I mentioned, so I went back to face to face. I did some training and this was at um, Inglehurst uh, Infant School in Leicester. And this is in their school hall. And it's a great picture because it, I just wanted to show you how how there's nothing really there, how it's a really empty hall. It's got loads of space you can see behind and in front. The chairs are all stacked up as you can see. Um, but it just goes to show you that the space that you need, you don't need a cooker near you, don't need a hob near you. It's a table and it's a chair. Now you've also got things like plastic bowls and jugs, but it's very, very limited in what I use in cook and eat. And the reason for this is because if I use equipment, that we take for granted, maybe things like, um, let me think, a garlic crusher, for example. And if you use that in front of the family and then they haven't got that at home, they are less likely to do that recipe. So it's very important that if you can use as little equipment as possible in these sessions, so then you can show the families that actually back at home, you don't need much equipment. You need a bowl and a spoon and maybe a grater. Now, the other two, um, uh, well, I don't even want to call them. The other two things on the on the left on the right hand side, left on you, right for me, is one of them is an induction hob, which is an electric hob which moves around the school brilliantly, plugs into the wall. It's really clean, so it's just wipeable, um, and that can be moved and used wherever. When I use it, I took it into the corner, high up, took it into the corner away from everybody. I often put chairs around as a little barrier so the children can't come anywhere near me. But it gives you an opportunity to cook something right in front of their eyes from scratch. So if you made a stir fry, for example, and everybody prepared everything, you bring all the ingredients back and then I would make that stir fry in the wok right in front of them. Which again, you know, the taste buds go in, the smells go in, the children are like, oh, I can smell it, it smells delicious, the ginger goes in, the garlic. Um, and it's just brilliant. One thing I would say about the induction hob is they're not expensive. You can get them for about 20, between 20 and 30 pound nowadays. Um, but you need to make sure that your pans are induction friendly. And what I mean by that is if you're unsure, it does actually say it often now on the packaging when you buy them. But if you're unsure, if you just take a magnet, stick it to the bottom of the pan. And if the magnet um, is attracted, then it'll work on induction. So that's a good test to take your little magnets with you. And then the other one that I have there, again, is electric and it gets plugged into the wall and it's movable. Um, I call it my party pan. I don't know any other word for it, but it comes out whenever party and you can do all sorts in it. You can fry in it. You can even, I've even tried to do scones in it. I know that sounds crazy because it's not an oven, but if you turn it on the lowest setting and you throw some water in the bottom, it creates steam, put the lid on and it actually works. They don't rise very much as the wood in the oven, but it actually does work. 
But again, that's portable, it's easy to clean and very cheap. Um, that I think it's Andrew James who makes those ones. But again, you'll find them on the internet, but they're brilliant too. So that picture okay, was just to I, show you. Yeah. I, I, put, I put that in the, the chat, but I was Oh, just have you the saying, name of it? Yeah, it's, it's the multi-cooker um, and it is Andrew James from Amazon, that it? one. And it's about 28 pounds. But um, I just, uh, tell them about when you made fish fingers in the primary school with oh, yeah. uh, and how you so, organized that <laughs> yeah, so we did so they did um, a project on pirates um in in es when I, my son Ezra was in year two so I went in and we made fish fingers from scratch but what we did was um I bought frozen fillets to start off with white ones because they're cheaper and defrosted them and then we had like panne stations so we had a station for flour a station for the egg and a station for the breadcrumbs and they were all in a little line and they were all putting the fish through along this along the um production line which they absolutely loved and then after they panned them, I fried them straight away in that pan in front of them and then dealed them out. And they absolutely loved them. It blew their mind to think that fish fingers could come from this raw piece of fish. But again, what a great opportunity for them to see that. And Michaela, what, what always um, stuck with me, though, about you've, you've missed out saying it, is the way that everybody got their own fish finger back because you started at the top of the register at 12 o'clock in that pan and yeah, then you, put, that. Yeah, them that's all, true. Forget that. you put them round so that everybody got their own back, which is important, you know, people yeah, want to eat their gosh, own food. That is so true and remember that, remember at the end of it, it's important that they get back their own, not just for health and safety, but they're proud of what they've made. And Jane's absolutely right. When I put things into that pan, I put it in clockwise, clockwise, so I know exactly whose is what. And then sometimes if I am really unsure, I'll get a post-it note and I'll stick the post-it note all the way around the pan to say, I don't know, sometimes I call them coloured tables. So I like blue table, green table, yellow table, so that I know whose is who. And the children then get ownership for it. But yeah, that was a great, they loved it. But those pans, if you're struggling for equipment within school and you don't have a cooker to use then they are brilliant so I would def definitely recommend to invest in those next one. Oh, so uh, we mentioned food banks at the start um, and food banks have been invaluable to me in, in my job and I've connected to many of them within Leicester City um, and what they do is they can provide you with food bags that you can then give to families and you can cook with the ingredients that are in there and I, this is a picture that I took when I was in Inglehurst as well, the same school. Um, and what I do when the families come in, I'll put this out with the bag and the ingredients and I'll give them some post-it notes and pens, but they can also verbalise it. They don't have to write it down. And I'll say to them, OK, what would you make with the things on this table? And what you find out very instantly will then help you in your delivery. Because, for example, on that table, there's some red lentils. Now, somebody might never have seen a red lentil and not sure what to do with the red lentil. So therefore, you could say, well, it's great. You just some garlic, some ginger in a pan with some stock and it's delicious. Um, there's noodles on there. There's, there's pasta, there's rice. But I also just want to let you know that in food parcels, you don't just get staples. You don't just get fresh, frozen and tinned. What you do also get is unusual ingredients. So I've been in, in food banks before where they've been given golden beetroots, um, celeriac, even scallops, which blew my mind because they're very expensive, but they're short dated, obviously, and that's why they go to the food bank. But if you treat, treat scallop, it's a fish. You treat it as a fish, it could go into a fish cake. I know it's sacrilege. I know my chef brain is saying, why would you put a scallop in a fish cake? But you could, and that's how it could be used. Um, so think about that. And so then they brainstorm and they're thinking, and then you can then come in and talk about, well, actually that whole bag of rice, you know, that could last you a very long time. If you cook it, cool it properly, you can make some egg fried rice the next day. Um, the noodles as well, you don't need all those noodles, you could eat those out. So there's so many different things that you could talk to at this stage. But what you're trying to do from this exercise is you're just trying to find out what would they use and what would they eat with these ingredients? Because then you will definitely find out if there any of those ingredients are unusual to them, they're not sure how to make them. Um, and then also just to see if they're cooking it right. Pasta and rice, it's quite difficult to cook, especially rice. So, you know, you might have some good advice on the absorption method, which you could teach them, things like that. But yeah, it's a good way to get them talking. It's a good way for them to start talking to each other. It's a good way for them to talk about their barriers as well, to eating good food. 
what is it? Is it fuel? Is it lack of ingredients? Is it lack of time? Is it fussy eating? All those things. And they all come out in this exercise. And this is a great way to start off your cook and eat session. Uh, next one. So this picture here, this shows the demonstration table. So this is how I start my cook and eat. So we've done the food bag. We've talked about that. We've, we've gone through all that. We've had some ideas. And then I will demonstrate and I will demonstrate basic cooking skills. So this section will be about knife skills as well. So we'd start from reception. We'd start from the young ones and we talk about peeling. Um, so how they use their hands and then we'd move on up and we introduce the knives and we talk about the bridge and the claw and how that moves forward. When I demonstrate these at the start, I demonstrate with seasonal ingredients as much as possible to reinforce that as, um, from Food for Life and also cost. Um, and I talk about equipment at this point. I'll talk about how you don't need the garlic crush. That's not necessary. But what you could do is a, with a bowl um, and just try to reduce the amount of equipment that you think they might need. Um, also making it clear what skills are appropriate for children and adults in that situation as well so may not be using a peeler but they could maybe some break some broccoli using their hands um, and the other thing in that picture as well i want you to notice is you'll see in in the bottom right there's a little box of knives now i always carry my knives in a box with a lid and i count my knives in and out within sessions it's safety obviously but it's also just to know that I know where every knife is at any point. Um, so that's a really good thing. And then I never get the knives out, by the way, of my kit until I'm ready to use the knives. My knives will never be laid around. OK, they come out when they're needed. They get washed and they get put back. But all that gets taught through the session. And it's not the children, actually, that are naughty ones. It's actually the adults that are the naughty ones. So just bear that in mind with the equipment. Um, it's important to know what you can do. Now, demonstrations. So you can demonstrate to the room beforehand and then they go away and they go away and make the recipe. You can demonstrate along with them as well. If you feel like their confidence is low, again, you'll get that from your initial talking. Then sometimes I like to demonstrate along with them so they can see exactly what I'm doing. But then also there'll be other opportunities where we call, uh, me and Jay call spot dems. So you might notice something happening on a table and you might think, hmm, that's a bit, um health and safety let me just so then you'll call everybody around to the spot them and you'll demonstrate something just to make sure that they understand what's achievable and what you're asking of them and that's important as well different ways of demonstrating next one so uh we have something called set outs and we've had this for years um it's a really important way of working it's there because it's useful for you to know what's on each tray because every tray is different this you get single set outs and group set outs a single set out would be for one person who would be cooking their own food with their own equipment a group set out would be a tray in the center with all the ingredients on where everybody would share but they would have um, share the equipment as well so obviously during covid if you were concerned we'd obviously recommend single set outs as much as you can um, and this recipe here is actually for a for tartar that we do. And we do this with young children. And you might look at it and think, but hold on a minute, the bacon's already cooked, the potatoes are already done. But that's important because you don't have very long with these families. You may only have an hour and you need to think of what do you really want them to learn in this session? Well, this session was all about eggs. We wanted them to learn about the variety and how you cook eggs differently. So our focus wasn't on cooking the bacon and the potatoes. It was actually the cracking, well, talking about the story of an egg, what's on an egg, the date, the lion mark, what all that means, the cracking of the egg, the whisking of the egg, the seasoning, all those important things. Um, but as you can see, very clean on a white tray, Everything looks very tidy um, and it's really important that every tray looks the same because it gives confidence to all the families in the room if everything's the same. Because if you go back to school, you remember if you were a bit stuck on your homework or you work in a classroom, you'd look across the room and if somebody was doing the same thing as you, you'd go, oh, I know what I'm meant to do next. And that's exactly what we're trying to emulate in the classroom with us. We need them to have that confidence. And if everybody has the same, they have that confidence which is really important. Um, next one. So this is 
set outs again but what we've done here is we've showed you different set outs appropriate for different age groups so the, the first one would be for reception in year one and two where the children's hands are smaller so that's why everything's been cut smaller so they can hold it safely the potatoes that we've used are actually new potatoes which have been boiled so again it's soft enough for them to cut um, and the herbs have been done already and the onions been done already because that's not appropriate for a, a small child to do and as you go along you'll see that there's less and less preparation as they get older so the middle one is put say year three four five and then as you get older as you get to adults you can see there's absolutely no preparation done for them um, and they're going to do everything themselves now in a family situation where you've got children and adults sometimes the adults do take over and take all the ingredients and then the children are stood there doing nothing so what we're trying to do with this is we're trying to encourage them to allow them to do something safely so you would direct and guide your adults in this situation to cut the leek for example into small pieces that then they can give to their children and then the children then can use their hands to tear the leek so it's about working together which are the jobs for the children which are the jobs for the adults but you can do both beautifully in a, in a classroom setting with the families um, and they can cook together and they can cook everything together. And just something there, Michaela, I always find something like a, a fruit crumble is a good one to do as a family because the rubbing in is really easy, even for the youngest children. Um, yeah. Whereas apple preparation, you know, peeling, coring, slicing apples is, yeah. is quite tricky. So that's worked really well. Uh, yeah. in that family situation and you've got to remember they've got to be on task it's like being in the classroom you know if you've got a child in the kitchen with you and then you, you want them to help but then they've got nothing to do then they, what they're going to do they're going to mess about so that's why it's always really good to give them something to do and even if it's going to drive you insane and it's going to be a mess then you know if he's quiet for five minutes and he's loving being in the kitchen with you that's okay um, I often used to give Ezra, like if I was making pastry, like bits, ends of the pastry that then he can just shape and mould and play with. But he's in the kitchen, he's with you, he's experiencing the cooking and the smells and you're talking about food and you're being social, which is brilliant. Uh, so we did mention this, hands as tools. First thing you would do with your little ones, they can do this from their babies. One, two, give them a bit of food, break it, snap it. Often with children nowadays, they do what they call baby led weaning, where they give the children whole things nowadays in their hands as well as purees. So remember your, your hands are your best tools. Even when you're an adult, they can tear herbs, break mushrooms, crumble cheese, peel oranges. You might have to just nick them first of all. They quite find it difficult to get in there to start with. Um, shredding lettuce, tearing leeks, all these things are brilliant for them to help you with. It's just sometimes thinking out the box. Okay, what can I do? I need to chop herbs, okay, but I'm not going to give them a knife. Well, let, let them just tear the, tear the herbs. That's fine. Use their hands. That's a great way to engage them from really early on. Um, knife skills, bridge. Bridge and claw we teach. The bridge is to cut something in half uh, where the knife goes through the bridge, as you can see on the picture. Uh, and the blades, the little jagged edges. So let me just quickly talk about the knife. So this is a serrated knife. It's age appropriate. It's a small paring knife. It has serrated teeth on the end, on the edge. And we do that because we want them to know what the sharp side is. Before they are allowed to pick up the knife, we will ask them to use their finger and pretend that their finger is the knife before it goes through the tunnel. And we'll do that a few times. And then we allow them to pick their knife up, making sure the teeth are facing down, they go through the tunnel. And what's very important because it's a serrated knife is to do a sawing action. So backwards and forwards, backwards and forwards. Okay, if they just to push down, they squash it and it doesn't work. But those little knives are brilliant. You can get them from anywhere now. I, got, I just got a new set from Amazon. They're not that expensive. Um, but they are really good. And from the age of four, we give children sharp knives and we teach them the bridge. They'll do the bridge till about their six, seven, seven, maybe seven, you can introduce the claw. But if you're cooking all the time, then their knife skills will improve and you could bring that in earlier. But that's the bridge. So that's to cut something in, in half. Uh, the next one, 
is the claw. So you hold your hand as a claw, hence the name, and this is to cut something into small pieces. This is actually how the chefs use knives. Um, if you watch food telly, they use the knives exactly the same in professional situations. Um, and they've got their thumb tucked behind, their fingers bent round, and you can see that they can saw all the way along that spring onion and nowhere near their fingers. Now, one big tip, when they get to the end of that long, thin spring onion, they'll often turn their fingers into something called, me and Jane, we called it the pinch. And it's where their fingers are squished together and they're holding it tightly. Now, if you see them do that, their thumb is very vulnerable, okay? So we need to keep that claw. So you need to make sure when they get to the end of that spring onion or courgette or whatever they're chopping, they keep that claw, that's very important. And they said, that will come in a bit later on in life um, as they get older. And then everything, everything that you cook and chop, bridge, claw, bridge, claw, that's it. And you'll probably spend the whole session, session bridge, claw, bridge, claw, but it works, it really does. Uh, the next one. Now, I just wanted to show you this recipe. This is a brilliant recipe that I did in the, in the same place uh, in Leicester. And this was noodles in a jar. Um, and Jane wrote this, I'm not taking any credit for it, it was a brilliant recipe. Um, and what it is, is you put all your veggies and your noodles into a glass jar um, throughout the session. So you're preparing ingredients and you're popping it in the jar and preparing it in and the noodles. And then that jar goes into the fridge. And then when you're ready to eat it for a snack or a dinner, all you do is pour boiling water into it, leave it to stand for a few minutes, and then you've got your own instant pot noodle and it is brilliant. And you don't have to buy kilner jars. You could just use old jars that have been washed and sterilized. Um, again, you're talking about recycling and you're thinking about nature and health and climate when you do that. So that's really important when talking about cooking and food. Um, and also, when I do the demonstration at the start that you saw, when I was demonstrating the bridge and claw, all those vegetable bits that I'm using, I'm gonna I'm put in my little jar to just to show them that there's no waste. Um, and I also talk about composting and how you can use vegetable peelings to make vegetable crisps really easily. We love doing that. You just put all your peelings on a tray, salt and pepper, a bit of oil, put it in the oven, 10 minutes, 200, you get some lovely vegetable crisps, so don't know waste. But that recipe was absolutely brilliant, loved it. Uh, fish cakes. Now, oh, we are terrible at eating fish in this country. Terrible. We're surrounded by water, but we are still terrible. So we do need to increase our, our fish consumption. Um, oily 3, omega 3, we know the good uh, that has for brain function. It has been proven. But we need to increase our fish, particularly oily fish. Now, oily fish is your salmon, your mackerels, your pilchard, your sardines. Think about animal welfare. You know, is it a sustainable fish? Um, there is an um, MSC website you can go on to to make sure that you're using sustainable fish because it does change. Sometimes um, in my other role, um, if I'm using something like sea bass um, and I'm thinking, mm, I'm not sure, I'll check on the website. Uh, linking it to school meals because school meals, they have to serve oily fish once a week, part of the school food plan. It's very important. So you're also in thinking, getting them to think about how else they can incorporate it. It doesn't have to be fresh, by the way, it can be tinned. So it could be tinned sardines, till pitch pilchers, um, which some people are still funny about, but actually they're really good. When you make this recipe, you mix it with the potatoes and the herbs and the vegetables and they taste really nice. Um, you can make them individually, or you could go back to that production line that I spoke about with, my, with the fish fingers that I did with Ezra's class, which worked brilliantly. So you can get them flour, egg, breadcrumb, teach them the French term, teach them the word pané. Why not? You know, if you bring in languages into school, they love that. I love it if I teach them maybe the word julienne or a baton or pané, and they love that. So use that language as well. Um, and then I often do get them to taste it at the end because I feel like this is one where it could go home and then it could get put in the bin. So I often, I do try and cook these in my uh, multi-cooker pan. I'm going to use now, not potty pan, in my multi-cooker pan. Um, and I cook them and then I get them to eat them, um, to taste them at least because they might be reluctant to do that. Um, yeah. Uh, stir fry, we spoke about this too. This is brilliant. So you can use whatever's left over in the fridge. That's a good point to talk to them about this. So you know those odds and ends, you've got a little bit of carrot and it's gone a bit limp and it's looking a bit sad. Chuck that in, odd bit of lettuce, chuck that in. Anything that you've got, fresh, frozen, tinned is brilliant for this. Talk about your seasonality again at this point and the growing aspect. 
some people might have growing space. They might have a windowsill. We do say, you know, start small, windowsill, herb box is a great idea. Teach the children to look after something, water it. What does it need? It needs sunlight, all linking to the national curriculum in science as well, which is great. So you're emulating that. So I think growing, if you can, potatoes, tomatoes, whatever. Um, I did a project over the summer where we gave families uh, seeds and I was amazed to see how many families grew and made uh, grew their own tomatoes and rocket and it was just brilliant. Uses store cupboard ingredients that we've mentioned so like soy sauce and herbs and spices so if you are going to introduce those to families and they are going to come in their food bags again this is a great recipe that you can use this in. Equipment just need a pan doesn't even have to be a wok. Frying pan will do one pan and one spoon and some heat on your induction hob if you're going to do it right in front of them or if they're going to take it home and do it at home and that on that point please remember that you don't always have to cook everything in school things can go home and be cooked if there are facilities to do that um, but that's quite sensitive that area so that question gets asked quietly to one side individually not as a group um, because some people might not have some people might be in hotels um, in bed and breakfast, etc. So they might not have access. So they might want you to cook it within school. So please be wary of that. Not everybody will have access to everything. Um, great way to demonstrate your nice skills, peeling skills. Quick, it's healthy because it's been in the pan for like matter of minutes. So you're going to keep all those nutrients in there for the children as well. And in my experience, they do actually prefer raw vegetables than cooked. Um, Another story, my Ezra wouldn't eat broccoli cooked, but well, I used to put it on his plate for his Sunday dinner and it was raw and he used to eat it. Lovely. I don't mind as long as he's eating it. So think about that as well. Think about raw and cooked. They might like it better raw. Texture thing as well off, off, a lot of the time. Great group activity, like I said. So you could have different tables. You could have somebody peeling ginger, somebody grating a carrot, somebody doing the noodles, somebody preparing the munch too or the sweet corn. And then you bring all those ingredients together and then you cook in front of them and they get to taste it um, straight away. And there might be some unusual ingredients in there that they might not have seen. They might not have seen fresh ginger before. Um, so you can introduce them to things like that. And tips like freeze the ginger, don't keep it in the fridge because it will last longer and you can grate it from frozen. All those little tips that you can give to them as well because they might think, well, I don't want to buy fresh ginger because I might never use it again. Well, that's a fair enough point. But if you put it in your freezer, then it's always in there. So that's a good one. And there's a question about how, how many families you'd have at any one time in a, a, a room. But I guess that very much depends on the room size and, you know, in, in the situations at the moment where, uh, you know, you're having to distance a little bit more. Um, but any tips yeah. on that? So I would say no more than six at a time. And depending on the number of children that they have. So, so normally it would be six families and there's two children that are with them. And then that is, that's in a hall environment within COVID where we are now, that's in a hall environment. If you are in um, a classroom environment, then I would say no more than three because you'd really need to space everybody out in that way. So six, if you're in a large hall, large space, three if you're in a classroom or a um, uh what do you call it or any other room that you're using that's just smaller that's how i would definitely and, say you know, sometimes you might just work with one family um you know yeah, i mean that there might be a real place. need yeah. yeah and think about it that one family might not want other families around and that's fine because for whatever reason you know if maybe if it's weight management that you're trying to talk about then have that sensitivity offer them as a one-to-one -one, and, and, and grow that confidence because what might happen is if you give them four weeks maybe even two weeks of just you and them then in that confidence they might think oh well actually I could go to the one where there's other families there which often happen as well so be aware of that all families might not want to be in the same room um, for, for different reasons so again those conversations will happen separately privately um, with nobody else around um, and remember you don't always have to cook hot food um, salads, brilliant. We love doing salads and food for life. And what we also love to do, we also love to incorporate fruit into them as well, because you'll often find children are more likely to eat fruits than they are vegetables. And if there's a strawberry in there or a satsuma or something that they know that they like, then they're more likely to try it. Um, and it can be really nutritious and there's no fuel being used. 
Okay, so that's a really big thing with our families nowadays is how much fuel is this going to use? Well, with a salad, no fuel, and that can be really nutrition, really full of nutrients as well for everything that's in there. It's great for your five a day to increase that. But um, I've done that since Ezra was a baby. I've put apple in there, a bit of celery in there, as well as everything else, and it, and it does get eaten um, better than if there isn't anything in there. I've just put a little note saying that couscous is good. I mean, this salad here, it's yeah. got pasta in yeah. it um but you know yeah if, if if you could have done it with couscous where you've just put your couscous in a bowl and topped it up with boiling water or a little bit of boiling stock and some um a covering over the top of it plate over the top of it uh just to steam so yeah that that would work uh, in that situation um i think we're nearly there michaela and let's just see oh it's on yeah yeah so we did touch on this before. So obviously clean hands before. So if, if you're doing the tasting at the end of the session, um, I'd always get them to wash their hands again. Then obviously no double dipping we mentioned. Um, make sure the food looks really attractive. So one of mine and Jane's bugbears is when we go into a primary school and we see that they've been given the fruit and veg scheme and they've been given a, um, a, a box of tomatoes, for example, so they'll put the tomatoes out into a bowl and ask and expect the children to eat them like an apple. Well, I don't know about you, but I've never eaten a tomato like an apple. So what we recommend is we recommend that they slice them or chop them, put them onto a plate, season them as well if you want to, because it obviously enhances the tomato flavour brilliantly. But think about how you present food for the children to taste. What, what we don't necessarily like in Food for Life is what we call funny face cooking. Now, when saying there's nothing wrong with making a face from food, if, that, if the child is going to eat it, but we don't want to patronise children. And every time that family goes home, is that mum or dad or whoever's at home that loves them, are they going to make a funny face out of that plate of food? No, they're not. So we need to set standards high from the beginning. So really nicely presented in little groups. If you're doing tasting of different colored apples, for example, a variety of apples, making sure they're in different bowls and being cut up nicely, you can see the skin. Drink of water available to cleanse the palate, paper towels or napkins for obviously hands and mouth. Um, talk about the senses, what can you taste and smell. If you're in a room where you have access to a literacy board with loads of words, that comes in great at this point because then it's brilliant for the children's literacy. The sound that they make, you know, when you're snapping broccoli, all those things, talk about that. Um, you taste it all together, all as one. So you don't allow anybody to eat it first because sometimes you'll get a err or a yuck. And then what that happens is then that goes like, like wow, fly around the room. And then everyone's like, I'm not eating that. It tastes disgusting. So what we do is we taste it together. It's like a one, two, three in your mouth. And then you'll see everyone looking at each other, like what's everyone's reaction. So that works really well. And we're making it fun. You know, we're talking about the taste and the flavor and we're, we're being role models. We're saying how amazing it is, even though you might not like it yourself, but you're saying that it tastes delicious. And that role modeling is really important. So we all have our likes and dislikes ourselves, but um, I can't say them when I'm delivering. I, I, I will tell you, I do not like mushrooms. And I know it's crazy, but I won't, but I won't eat them. Um, but I will keep that to myself in that situation. And if I have to taste a mushroom, I will put a mushroom in my mouth. Um, and then likes and dislikes and alternatives. So get a feel for what they like. When you talk to them in your first session, they might be like, oh, Michaela, I'm really struggling making this or, Oh, I can't make, I can't cook rice, you know, I'm rubbish at it. So be open to changing maybe some of the recipes that you've thought of according to what they want. And then because it gives them opportunity to taste it and, and, and see if they like it and um, if they're going to maybe swap out ingredients and use that feedback, like I said, for other, for other sessions. So if you make something in the first session and you think it's a bit flat and then they do not think they're really into it that much, talk to them. Say, what do you want to learn? What would you like to cook next week? And you'll always get the bacon. You'll always get chocolate cake and pancakes. And, and they're fine. We have great recipes in Food for Life. We have a great beetroot and chocolate cake we use. We have a great um, pancake recipe that we use as well that uses oats and some cottage cheese. So there are recipes that you can do that make them healthier. And I often, what I do is I'll put that one at the end. So like a more of a celebration. So if they want the chocolate cake, I'll say, okay, like we'll do that, but then we'll put the beetroot in and we'll do that at the end as a celebration. Uh, and just remember about the baking, as much as you can make it savory, um, 
the better.